Hello, and welcome to Connecting the Dots. My name is Mark Lardner. This is an If Center Live series of monthly webisodes focused on translating assessment data into meaningful metrics. We're trying to answer the question of how we can use person-centered data to move us closer to transformational systems that work for all people. Each month, we'll hear from a different guest who will share their insights on how to better use data to understand the transformational process. And I'd like to welcome all of you uh, who are here and welcome to the people from the TCOM community. Uh, as you know, we like to be collaborative. So make sure you find that chat box and share your comments or your questions. And we'll try to keep this as interactive as we can. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my first guest. He really needs no introduction. He's a former painter for the Speedway Indiana Water Company. He's the author of over, of over 300 publications on how to improve helping systems. He's the author of a new book entitled Transformational Collaborative Outcomes Management. Um, he is your friend and my boss, Dr. John Lyons. Welcome, John. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm happy to join uh, you on your inaugural uh, episode. I'm really excited about what you're gonna be able to share to the larger TCOM community about advancing our work. Great. Well, I'm excited too. I'm glad that you're the first guest is certainly launching this at the start of 2023 is checking off a box for one of the New Year's resolutions. So we're off to a good start here. Um, so uh, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your time. Uh, let's just jump right in. One of the things I want to get your thoughts on before we discuss some of the innovative approaches to using communometric data, I'm hoping you can kind of walk us through what are some of the pitfalls in traditional research or traditional um, approaches to data analytics? Well, you know me, I like to uh, talk in stories. And so there's a couple of experiences that I've had early that introduced uh, what I think are some of the major problems with our traditional approach. Our traditional measurement approach is psychometric theory. And a lot of people think that psychometric theory is science, but it's just a belief system about how you do science. And I think the belief system is fraught. It's a problem. And so the kind of experiences that I had early, uh, first, I was uh, funded by NIMH to do an evaluation um, with colleagues of psychiatric liaison in a uh, orthopedic unit, and we used uh, older adults with broken hips as a tracer uh, condition to see what the impact was on their health. And we, you know, we're being rigorous, right? We're being scientists, and so I used, uh, we used all the different um, evidence-based measures, and so we used a thing called the geriatric depression scale, which is a 15-item measure of depression. It was designed specifically for an older adult population. And it's 15 questions, and of course it's psychometric, so you have to ask those 50, 15 questions. You have to ask them in that order, and you always have to ask the questions. Well, one of those questions was, do you feel particularly helpless the way you are now? So these are older adults who just broke their hips, who are lying in a bed in pain, and here comes a 20-something-year-old interviewer coming in, do you feel particularly helpless the way you are now? I mean come on. I mean, so we got what you would clinically call apex storm, right? People were upset that we would even be stupid enough to ask that question. So the structure of the tool and the science of it was completely at odds with actually getting an understanding of this uh, person's experience. The second experience I had that was fundamental was I was asked to do an evaluation of pet therapy. So this was dogs learning uh, it was actually girls who were in a treatment program for substance abusing for substance abuse were trained how to train dogs. So it was a teaching program where the girls learn how to train dogs. It's a six week program, and the girls loved the dogs, and the dogs loved the girls. Everybody liked it. They wanted to evaluate it. I tried to talk them out of it because everybody likes it. Now, what's the big deal? So that they wanted <laughs> they wanted funding. I don't know what they use the funding for bones anyway. So. I said, okay, I'll do it. So what do you think it does? So I said, what do you think the impact of this is? And they said, well, we think it builds self-esteem. So these are girls that really haven't succeeded in much, and this gives them a master experience, and so we think it actually builds their self-esteem. So we took a standard measure of self-esteem, the Rosenberg self-esteem inventory, which was the classic psychometric measure at the time, and we gave it to these street smart substance abusing girls. And in, with the first eight girls, and with every single group that we ever did, we found 
plummeting self-esteem. It was statistically significant with eight girls in every group. You saw the same thing rapidly, dramatically declining self-esteem. So were we actually destroying these young ladies' sense of themselves by having them train these loving dogs? I don't think so. I think what was actually happening is these street smart some of these girls were, you know, a suit comes in. I wasn't back to suit. Um, came out, comes in and said, how do you feel about yourself? They say pretty damn good and get out of my face. It's not a, it's not, you're not measuring self-esteem. You're measuring what people choose to communicate to you about your self-esteem. And so that's when I began to think, wait a minute, the framework doesn't make any sense. The framework that we think is science doesn't actually capture what's happening in clinical enterprises in a way that's meaningful at all because of the structure of it. So that, those are the two stories that lead me to believe that, hey, we need a different way of thinking about this work. Yeah, I mean, certainly the jury's still out on whether you crush young people's self-esteem, but putting that aside. <laughs> um, that, I'm not yeah. referring to the staff. <laughs> <laughs> so that um, th these traditional approaches, though, they are hard to dismantle because, you know, even yeah. like you're telling stories from, you know, 20, uh, 30 years ago here. But these are, I mean, I have similar ones uh, from my early work. And certainly I think, you know, early in the university world, I, I we, Colleagues and I discussed that we wrote reports that people didn't read, mostly because they told us things that either were not believable or disconnected from the experience that people were having that we were interviewing. So what makes it so hard to dismantle some of these traditional approaches? Well, you know, there's history, right? And so and I think people actually believe it is science rather than it's a belief system of how to do science. Um, I mean, Psychometrics was first published in the same year by the same author as eugenics. So Sir Francis Galton published two books at the same time, Psychometrics and Eugenics. And eugenics is the theory of white supremacy, of Nazism. And so if you begin to take back the history and understand this, this notion of having a set of items that you decide and you will ask in the order that you determine using the words that you choose and get that to reveal something important about the other person and had nothing to do with you is no longer, it doesn't fit the philosophy of science, but I think uh, much of our field is still stuck in logical positivism, although the philosophy of science has moved past logical positivism. You know, logical positivism is there is this reality there that if you just send enough probes in there, you will see this reality. Almost no philosophers of science really think that that's actually reflective of what the process of science is. Physicists with Heisenberg and Wittgenstein, they, they know that the process of measurement changes the phenomena you're measuring. But for some reason, we are not yet willing to embrace that within our field. I think it comes. I think, you know, some of it is a generational change. Uh, some of it is a technology change. But I think it's mostly a personal change of us learning that just because we learn something in graduate school does not make it true. In fact, most everything we learn in graduate school turns out to be not true. So I think being flexible and learning and changing is a hard, hard thing to do. Yeah, I would agree. I think that it is maybe time is a big factor there in this generational yeah. change. You know, perhaps too, one of the things that I know you do and a lot of the group does is to try to bring new voices to the table too, to try to seed that change. Yes you know, to take those approaches that are collaborative and consensus based um, and try to see, you know, if we have a collaborative consensus based assessment, can we have collaborative consensus based data analytics or data reporting? Yeah. And that, I think that's the two things about community metrics that's so important. One is that you don't need multiple items to measure one thing. You actually can measure one. And so community, community psychometric theory says, no, 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 you cannot have a measure that doesn't have multiple items. And that's just simply not true. I mean, look at, I mean, go to any obstetrics unit in the world and ask them how they measure the well-being of an infant. They say, you use APGAR, you know, single item, reliable, valid. That's, you know, community metrics comes out of that clinometric tradition. But the most important thing is this consensus-based assessment process, because I think this is the real science of the helping enterprise. And it's not this, so it's, 
really about how you manage triangulation because triangulation is a fundamental principle in science and it comes from originally astronomy it was the the method that actually was used to validate einstein's theory of relativity but the idea is if you want to measure the location of a planet what you do is you assess it from different places on earth at different times and then you can triangulate that data and then you can actually do all sorts of stuff the size of the planet the speed the planets are moving all sorts of stuff right by triangulating the measure so that got translated into our work in the 60s by my old mentor, Don Fisk, and his colleague at Northwestern, uh, Don, Stan, uh, Don Campbell, into multi-trait, multi-method theory, which says the way you actually triangulate in social sciences is you measure multiple perspectives. And by measuring multiple perspectives, you can actually triangulate to get what is really going on with this person. But that's not true. And, I, and we've been doing this for 70 years years right and it's simply not true so the example i like to use so humor me for a minute so what do you see here so i see uh, a red what looks like a coffee cup yeah so what do you see now i see a canadian superhero <laughs> there you go deadpool so when people ask me and those stupid uh, icebreaker things who's your superhero i always say deadpool because I can't tell you the number of times people have tried to kill the cans and it's still alive, right? You cannot kill the cans. You just have to learn to deal with it. Anyway, so this is the assessment problem. And the idea of triangulation is you look at it from multiple things and you'll be able to tell that this is a Deadpool coffee mug. But if you look at it just from this angle, you can't tell. Maybe it's Mrs. Claus. Maybe it's the devil. Maybe it's not even a person. Maybe it's something else, right? It's only when you see this. So. The idea of triangulation is you get a youth perspective, you get a parent perspective, you get a teacher perspective, and then you triangulate that. But that assumes every teacher is a replication of every other teacher. Every youth is a replication of every other youth, that their perspective is identical. Every therapist is a replication of every therapist. That's simply not true. So this mug is spinning. So sometimes the youth sees that it's Deadpool. Sometimes the youth and the therapist see it's Deadpool. Sometimes it's only the parent that sees it's Deadpool. Sometimes the parent and the youth see it as Deadpool, but the therapist doesn't see Deadpool. Sometimes the parent and the therapist sees Deadpool, but the youth doesn't see Deadpool. So you can never, ever, ever get to the reality that this is a Deadpool mug by measuring these different static perspectives and trying to statistically triangulate that. So you have to triangulate first and then measure, which is what metrics is all about. You triangulate first. So triangulation is still really important, but you do it first and then you measure. We actually have some slides to demonstrate that, I do believe. Yeah, so if we put this in the assessment context, right, we'll be able to, and you know, we'll use the, the example of a minimizing and catastrophizing youth and caregiver. And we can kind yeah. of see how this would play itself out over a series of, you know, intake or initial assessments and transition assessments. Yeah. So that first, you know, the parent is minimizing and the youth is catastrophizing. You know, this is be a consistent with an inter, um, internalizing disorder, you know, where the youth is holding all this stuff inside. The parent doesn't see it. So you ask the parent, well, their youth is fine. But you ask the youth, oh, this is horrible. So you see the very high blue for the youth in a very low blue for the parent. But then when you get treatment, a successful treatment would have two effects. The parent would begin to understand the youth's challenges. And so the parent assessment is gonna get worse because they see the youth differently because now they understand that young person's got challenges that they're experiencing internally. The youth on the other hand is gonna feel a lot better about themselves. And so their reassessment is gonna be an improvement. So let's do the opposite where you have a minimizing youth. You know, I, I do better at school when I'm high, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Um, if you have a minimize, so get, let's put on the next slide. If you have a minimizing youth and a catastrophizing parent, yeah, the parent is going to start out real high. That's the high blue column. And the youth is going to be low. They're saying, I don't have any challenges. And the parent is saying, oh my God, you know, help me, please. A successful treatment in that case, this is an externalizing disorder. A successful treatment in that case 
the parent's going to feel a lot better about things. And the youth is going to begin to realize, oh, maybe I didn't really understand my circumstances all that well. And so when you reassess the parent, they're actually going to get better, but the youth is going to get worse. So let's now take our standard program evaluation approach and just lump these all together and look at change over time. What you draw the conclusion, even though you have two successful cases, you draw the conclusion, nothing changed. And we've been doing this over and over and over again in our field, underestimating the value of what we do. And so the other piece and the title of this particular episode of your web or webcast is first ever last, right? So you started to show that next slide, which is another important piece of how you think about using you know, metrics. So, and because psychometrics is based on logical positivism, it is revealing a truth and you're stuck with the belief system that is revealing a truth. So if the score gets higher, you have to say they got worse because the measure is assuming you're revealing a truth. In a communometric measure, you're measuring the story. And anybody who's worked more than a week in a clinical setting knows that what happens is that as you get to know somebody, their story unfolds. So if you honestly think you can get a full story in a 45 minute hour at the start, the first time you meet somebody, you're wrong because people don't trust you. People are in the process of deciding whether they can reveal certain things to you. So it's very, very common that needs unfold over time. So it's very, very common that follow up kinds of um, challenges reveal themselves. So the initial assessment is never actually the best indicator of the baseline of somebody when they're seeking help. And so that's why we think if you're embracing a communometric approach, you look at the first ever last kind of approach, because that actually gives you the chance to reveal the real change that happens because you're giving credit for things that are detected later. Yes. And let's, so let's, kind of let's go ahead. Yeah, let's dive into that a little bit. I think the the what you know, listening to you talk, the main takeaway I have is that, you know, in thinking about this kind of more traditional the triangulation of information that leads us with no net impact, right? There's you know, we're not able to see any of the impact, meaningful impact of the work. Partly the reason that persists is because many people don't use assessments to measure impact. They're using that measure to say, well, here's what I'm tasked with doing at this moment in time, at a different moment in time, I'll have to do this again, perhaps, but I won't have to connect those two things. And looking at this report that's on the screen now certainly gives us, you know, looking over five time points, which some people may feel is a luxury for uh, their work, being able to assess the same youth or family uh, five different times. But it does drive home this point that we are actually trying to um, measure people's trajectory. And more importantly, I think, is this next slide is to try to look at this initial everlast, this first everlast idea, which takes into account the summation of needs. And so in this one, and we'll move quickly to the bar chart, but um, I've highlighted here, and this is from your book, the these kind of presenting issues, issues that show up as you talked about the first time you meet with somebody issues that are at any point in time of that work, whether you're doing two assessments, three assessments, four assessments, or five. And then as we depart, or as, as kind of people transition from care, this where those needs are, um, that gets us closer to being able to understand what is that net impact, that net gain that we have. And so um, I'd like you to talk a little bit on the next slide, kind of the two visualizations we have of bar charts of this first ever last. Well, I think when you look at, at ever versus last, you see the real clinical impact. Right. And you see it's way bigger than if you look at beginning and end. Beginning and end is a misleading comparison for the reasons that I described earlier. It's the, was this ever identified as an issue and did it get resolved in the course of care? That's your real impact. And you can see here that the difference is dramatic. It's, it's a difference between about a 20% need reduction and a 50%, over 50% need reduction. So it's dramatic when you begin to, to see the perspective of looking at uh, at realizing that the nature of the clinical enterprise is to reveal things and that that doesn't always happen at the first. And you're not really, you're, if you're measuring the story, it allows you to measure how that story unfolds just like that work. But let me go back to something you said, because I wanted, I have a, a thought about that. You know, people seem to disconnect assessment from the work, but I guarantee you anybody who actually is a helper, they do assessment 
every single time they meet somebody, every single time, the first thing you say is, how are you doing? And you're checking in about what's changed and what hasn't changed. So this idea that there's a way that's time to do an assessment and that's somehow separate from the process of helping simply isn't true. And so the design of a community metric attempt, uh, a measure is to attempt to make this exactly like the work. So you're not redoing an assessment, you're just updating your understanding of the person's story. Because if you're not actually doing that in your head, you're not actually a helper. And if you can do it in your head, you can actually do it in paperwork. And if you don't document it in paperwork, how does anybody know it ever happened, right? And how do you communicate it to the next person who's gonna try and help this person. Unless you're planning on working with this person, this family, the rest of your life, there's might be other people that actually are gonna try and help and how do you help them learn from what you learn? So you have to figure out ways to communicate that stuff. So I think we have to get past this sort of straw man argument of, oh no, 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 we're not gonna do another assessment. That's such a pain in the butt. You're always doing an assessment. You just have to make the documentation simple so that it's not something that is a burden on your life. Right. So there's a question in the chat, and I think this is a good segue here. And I'd be curious your answer to this because I have a thought about it. But the uh, so the question is, you know, what's the difference between community metrics and a mixed quantitative qualitative method? Although I might rephrase that into how would we use different quantitative or qualitative data yes. in a community metric approach? So the way to think about that is community metrics is actually grounded theory. Right. So every qualitative approach, at the end of the day, they take text data and they create a coding framework and then they put ratings in that coding framework. So all we've done is the items of the tools of the communicative tools do that for you. We've already gone through all the different kinds of common themes of people's stories that come out because that's how you design your customized version of this approach is what is what do you need to know? And when you listen to people's stories, what do you need to know? So we've done the first half of grounded theory for you. And all we do in the training is teach people how to apply the coding framework. And so it's fun functionally a qualitative a measurement approach that results in a quantitative output, which every single qualitative approach ends up becoming quantitative after you code it. So we've just taken care of a large amount of work for people so that they can actually just code it until you have quantitative data. Yeah, and I think the people who are find these tools useful and are successful in using them are in large part is because they're able to take that action framework, right? The, yes. And apply it uh, to the way they uh, discuss, converse, collect, gather information from people and work it into the conversation. So no longer am I trying to determine where you fit on any scale. What I'm really trying to get you in a conversation around is, is this something we're going to work on together, which is yes. a very qualitative uh, approach to doing this very work. And so the action right. framework is just the coding. You're right. Yeah. So the action levels become ipsative and right. the ratings become normative, right? So the, the, you know, who wants to work on what is a highly individualized concept. But once you get a standard of, okay, these are things that they, this group or this person agreed to work on, now you have something that's comparable across people. So the idea of the approach is to allow that kind of customization so that it's different for everybody, but comparability so that you can use the information across. And so a lot of people do analyses. They actually make, you always when you have more than one story, you have to simplify things because it gets too complicated. So what a lot of analysts do for purposes of simplicity is they break the four point rating scale into a two point rating scale. They dichotomize actionable versus non actionable. And that can be a really useful uh, thing. So you'll notice in the graphic that you had the total actual needs that's combining twos and threes together. Now, when you're working clinically, the distinction between a two and a three is important. And there are moments clinically for outcomes where the just uh, moving from a three to a two is important. But if you want to kind of simplify your work, I mean, if you can't resolve it, you haven't resolved it and that's not really successful, right? If this is, if you haven't resolved the need, it's an ongoing need. And so, you know, people talk about, you know, meaning, you know, they want to have statistically significant change. So the, another story I had, a, <laughs> when I first started working, I was working uh, with the outcomes of residential treatment and we used a measure called the CFARS, which is the, um, the people who are having it filled out call it the CFARS. But anyway, it was an 11 point scale. 
And it was, you know, because the idea is, oh, we want to be sensitive to change. And people say, well, uh, CAN's at a four-point scale. How on earth can that be sensitive to change? Well, it misses the point of what sensitivity to change is actually about scientifically. So scientifically, sensitivity to change is a combination of the range and the reliability of the items. So the CFARs had 11 levels on each item, 69 of the 11 levels. So they tried to label the levels with words. So a zero was non, not, and a two was slightly, which mean a one was less than slightly. Now you tell me who can make a distinction between a two and a one. I mean, this is not quite slightly, it's more less than slightly. And what does that even mean? I mean, it's, it's absurd. And so we could never get reliability of those 11 point ratings. And to get reliability to show people we're using the CFRs reliably, guess what? We had to collapse those 11 point scales into mm -hmm, four point scales, right? Because that's the detection level that becomes reliable. So people get confused since the CAN is reliable at the item level. It's extremely robust for change because change is a function both of the range, but also the reliability of the tool. So anyway, great. So it's just better science, but I think it's going to take some time, and I probably have to die, uh, for the general <laughs> scientific community to embrace the reality that, oh, the way we thought we were doing science isn't really very effective science, and the information age is a completely different world than the late. 19th century when all this stuff was originally invented. All right, well, let's hope those two things aren't connected, your death and these things taking <laughs> we'll out. See. Although maybe, yeah. I mean, did Rensis Likert, did his uh, demise lead to the adoption? Yeah, of Likert, yeah, yeah right. exactly. Okay. Um, I, all right, so I look forward to the demise of the Likert scale because, you know, tell me somebody who really can interpret that, so. I can slightly agree with that comment. Um, so here's... I'm a little what, less than slightly agree with that person. Are you somewhat agreeing to that? Um, so here's what I want to do. I, we're running short on time. What, you know, from your seat as the Ascender Director, uh, what excites you about the kind of, uh, you know, communimetric or innovative approaches of using communimetric data and data analytics? Um, what kind of things are coming up that you uh, yeah. are involved in well, or excited I'm, about? I'm extremely fight? excited about the near future because we finally are a position. So we, I've spent like the last 25 years building the infrastructure of teaching people how to use these kind of approaches. And at this point, you know, the 90% of every single child in the United States who has is either in child welfare or public behavioral health is touched by a CANS process. So there's a lot of information. So we're, we're increasingly able to pull that information together and we can begin to understand things from a person perspective, not from a perspective of what we do with people because the history of policy research has been based on large administrative databases, which have very little about people, but enormous about what we did with people. And that's a tragedy. It's led to all sorts of bad policy. So we're suddenly in a position where we can begin to look at systems from the perspective of person-centered design, from the perspective of people and people's needs and strengths, right? And so, and we're already beginning to find that there's more variation, for instance, and this is, we replicate this across states based on provider than based on person. So in other words, who providers are influence what happens way more than who people are. That's a problem, right? That's an opportunity to improve. If you do what you do because this is what we do and this is what our policy is at our agency, that might not be optimally effective. And that what we might want to figure out how to do is create this mass customization at this level. So I think what's really exciting is the breakthroughs with machine learning and the kinds of stuff that Olga and Sharon at the center are working on around using machine learning uh, approaches because that do not rely on the normal distribution because they are going to be non-parametric because we have massive data sets that represent populations. Uh, that stuff is really, really cool. And I do think it's going to cause some significant breakthroughs in how we understand the world in which we work. That is exciting. And that sounds like a perfect uh, opportunity for a future episode here on Connecting the yeah. Dots. So I'll be reaching out to 
some of our colleagues for that. As you should. Great. All right. Well, we're kind of at time. I want to thank you so much for being the first guest on Connecting the Dots. Um, you know, I appreciate you setting aside some time to speak with us. And it's really been a pleasure. So thank you, John. It's been a pleasure to meet you. I wish you the best of luck on this uh, this uh, series. I, I know that the world needs um, more help in terms of figuring out how to understand these data and what an opportunity is for all of us to begin to represent people and how we think about the performance of our programs. Great. All right. Agreed. This is a great opportunity. Thanks again to John. I'm sure everyone can second that in the comments. A couple things before we wrap up. I want to plug our next episode, which will be on February 14th. Our next guest is Dr. Scott Fairhurst. Um, he is from Pacific Clinics, and uh, he is the Vice President of Training, Outcomes, and, Eva Outcomes and Evaluation, and Business Analytics. Um, and so that will be on February 14th. Um, if you are new to TCOM or new to the TCOM channel, make sure you like and subscribe. Uh, that's just find those buttons on YouTube and click those if you've liked this content and if you want to stay up to date on future offerings on the TCOM channel. Um, also, please check out our updated blog, tcomconversations.org. Um, the link to that will be in the description below. Uh, additionally, there's a link in the description below to our GitHub repository, and we'll be posting sometime in the next couple of days some sample R code that you may be able to use to create some of the charts that we reviewed on this episode. Um, finally, uh, be on the lookout for another one of these If Center Live series uh, webisodes. This one is going to be hosted by Dr. April Fernando, and it's going to be about the new Equip project. And that's a project that's intended to support qualified individuals and those folks who are working in the US on the implementation of Family First within child welfare systems. And so again, I want to thank our guest, Dr. John Lyons. I want to thank all of you for being here. And I look forward to seeing you next time on Connecting the Dots. Have a great day.